It's been an excellent start to the season for both Motherwell and St Mirren. Two sides still sitting uh, top end of the table. They split Celtic and Rangers. The pair went head-to-head at the weekend and it was the Paisley side who came away still undefeated and are up to second in the Premiership. But his boss Stephen Robinson, we're delighted to say, spoke to Laura and Finn. I was not there! (laughs) Stephen, thanks for joining us first and foremost. You always say you don't get too low when results are bad, you don't get too high when results are good, but surely you must have sat down on Saturday night with a wine and felt pretty damn happy after that result. I definitely sat down with a wine, yeah. Um, (laughs) I'm very happy about the result. We didn't play particularly well, um, arguably our worst performance of the season. So as a manager, yeah, you're, you're very happy with the result, but... They're constantly thinking, you know, why didn't we play well? Did I give them too many days off over the international break? Did we work in the things we should have worked? Did we pick the right team? Um, we had a lot of international boys away, you know, traveling far away places, Kazakhstan and Sp- um, Gogos in Spain. Um, some of the boys were in Dallas with Australia. So it was, um, yeah, even though you win, you're still trying to pick holes in what you've done and trying to see if you, you can get it right and, and 100% right. Uh, yeah, but you want everything, a perfect performance and the perfect result. So, but um, yeah, we're doing okay at the moment. So we'll, we'll take the three points. It's been actually a pretty formidable start to the season for you because the, the opening League Cup game aside uh, away at Montrose, it's been a, a pretty flawless start to the season almost from um you had to bring from up you guys. Montrose. You had to mention Montrose. I forgot about that. Well, I, I was that, I put that in the back of my mind. So <laughs> <laughs> I was I was I was going to caveat that by saying already so early in the season you've you've played Motherwell twice and beaten them twice. So that must be quite a nice feeling for you, obviously, with your, your kind of connections to the club. It's a club you know well. But you, you've got to be happy with the way that the, the team started the, the season, not just with the the home form, which was pretty good last season as well, but you look to be matching that with the away form this season a bit as well. What's kind of been the the, the change there? I think the the biggest difference we we looked and we looked at all the stats last year. Our away form wasn't good enough. Um, you know, we we literally got into the top six based on our home form, and we looked at lots of things. And sometimes there's things you can control. You know, we played we played a lot of the games with ten men. I think it was six out of the the away games we played with ten men. So things like that you can't really control with decisions if it's for dissent or or something like that then you can but the decisions were you know getting sent off or second yellow cards handballs little tugs um we also didn't defend crosses as well away from home when we look statistically but we actually created a lot more chances we, we had more possession on the ball and we created more chances so there's a lot of anomalies in the statistics um for me probably the biggest change we've we've changed the system slightly to a three four three that I say that we we went to three five two at stages in on Saturday as well, but I think we've brought in more attacking players. Um, we've got more of an attacking threat than we did last year. I thought we were we were quite robotic at times. Um, when we lost Ethan Urahan at Christmas, we became a little bit straight line football, and there, there wasn't enough patience and ownership of the game. So I think we've rectified that. Um, as I say, we've brought in more options in the game yesterday. I was able to. To bring in three strikers, change three strikers, you know, during the game, change you know two centre halves. So I think we've got more options, still the same number of, of people in the squad, but I believe we've now got you know 17, 18 first team players as opposed to maybe you know 13 and 14 last year. So sometimes it's a little bit of luck as well. You know, sometimes luck goes your way, and it did yesterday, you know, a luck did go our way. So you know, Lady Luck shine is on us at the moment. So long may that continue. So I don't think it's a magical tactical wand that we've waved that that's made a whole lot of difference. It's just small things have, have gone our way. When when things aren't going your way and you're talking about that bad luck, does that become a psychological thing in players' minds? Does that play on their in their minds? Um I don't know. I mean, it's a long time ago where I used to believe magpies and um, squirrels and uh, what else do we look at? <laughs> you know, anything we can see that used to bring us good luck. But I, I know, you know, if your goalkeeper drops a ball, it's probably nothing to do with the, the magpie, I would imagine, or you miss one from two yards. I think as a manager and coaching staff, we explore every possibility to, you know, look back and think, how do we prepare? How do we set ourselves up for the game? Did, you know, did we press too high? Did we Did we not press high enough? And if you can tick all them boxes, which we, you know, we do on a Friday afternoon, so that we've prepared to the maximum, we've, you know, the players know exactly what we want from them. And sometimes you just don't carry that out. So when last season we, you know, there was a we we looked at it all that the players didn't lack confidence. We didn't approach the game any differently away from home. Our line of engagement was exactly the same. Um, 
and the players knew that and they believed that. And, and sometimes, you know, decisions, I think our decision making wasn't as good at home. We, we The one stat that stood out to me was where our running stats weren't as high away from home, home as they were at home. And our high speed running wasn't as high. You know, so you know, whether that's the crowd behind you, whether that's, you know, you feel a little bit more pressure, we don't know. But this year, we've that's one thing that has been rectified. You know, we we are matching our running stats away from home as at home. So perhaps that is what's what's making the difference. Is is there something that you can you can pinpoint or or detail in the way that you've changed as a manager as as the years have gone on? Because you're just talking there about like you know moving away from superstitions or things to give you luck. Not that that's what you would have based it all on, obviously. But um, but you you're looking at these kind of like marginal gains. You're looking at improving things in small ways to just try and give you that little bit extra. Were there specific things that happened or has it just been a gradual process of just the more you learn, the better you become confident in your own abilities or backing yourself or anything like that? Yeah, I think as, as anything in any walk of life, you evolve, don't you? You know, um, at the start, I was was very highly strong. You know, you're desperate for success, um, ranting and raved a lot. And then you realize, you know, I have a lot of good advice from from managers I work with. Mm-hmm. Players don't mean to make mistakes. You know, and with a small squad of players, you can't wave, wave a magic wand and you need them on board. You need the society's changed. You know, you can't shout and scream at people in any walk of life if if you're told you're not very good all the time you start to believe it you know and I think it's a it's a very difficult industry for for young men they're not getting paid fortunes and probably I've evolved in in terms of trying to give them all these reasons why if you criticize them it's constructive you know you you feedback has to be an answer to the the problem you know we'll go in tomorrow morning and have a couple of things for Richard Taylor or our center half where he got too tight and started ball watching so instead of criticizing we took him off at half time tactically because he was on a yellow card but you know hopefully by the end of tomorrow's session we've helped Richard you know we've analyzed it and we've you know we've I think that's probably been somewhere we've evolved a lot as a coaching staff I think Dermot O'Carroll coming in and working alongside me as well has been fantastic you know because we challenge each other. He doesn't agree with probably anything I say most of the time. But, um, you know, I've always surrounded myself with people that aren't yes men, so to speak. You know, they're, they've got huge opinions on the game. They've, they challenge me. They they make me look at my decisions and, and how I set up and what I want to do. And, you know, ultimately we walk out of the room agreeing. But I think that's probably the other thing I... I, I will, don't go with people that just agree with me. I want people that stand up to me that, you know, have an opinion that eventually makes us better. And as I say, you evolve with time, you evolve with society and, and young players are very different than, than when I played. I know that you you have to be very constructive with with any criticism that you give them. Obviously, we've seen so many of the, the Motherwell boys you had um, during our time together at the club move with you to St Midden. Not a lot of them there this season now, but... They must. Um, that's. Or I'll that's stop you there. You'll be very surprised. <laughs> I've got Jermaine Hilton training with me tomorrow, oh, who signed for our growth or part time. I've got Jake Carroll training with me as well. No way. I, I had Curtis Meehan training with me for six weeks before he we went to India. So we must be doing something right because the boys want to come back, and I think that speaks volume for the staff. And you know, hopefully, how we treat people is they still want to come and train with us. You know, Jake's recovering from a long term injury. Jermaine's in part time football. You know, trying to remain fit as well. So, uh, yeah, there's still quite a few of them still there. <laughs> that Tony was, that was next to me still. I know I've still got, still got him and Trevor and, and Decky still as well. You know, we text. So, yeah, there's, there's still a good Motherwell connection there anyway. Oh, I mean, that was kind of the path I was going down was they, they obviously like your style of management and uh-huh. you've got that persona with the players. But just for people who obviously don't know what you're like behind the scenes with the players, what kind of manager are you? Are you like straight like man to man with them and, and talk to them all the time or are you quite kind of aloof with them no I, I you can't be you know I, I believe at a smaller club you know you have to you have to see people for who they are and you have to know more about them you know if if someone's struggling at home you know football is no different than anybody else they all have problems they all have families they all have wives girlfriends boyfriends whatever it may be they're you know they have problems that they bring into work and you know if you can relate to that or you can help them in any shape or form ultimately you'll get a better performance on the pitch so I think again I've evolved with that I was um very black and white before where you know you, you play well and why aren't you playing well and it was you know without really a goal where I was trying to get the players to so now we I, I treat I treat everybody the same uh, you know from the, the the ladies that clean the the ground from the ladies that cook um to the groundsmen to the the captain of the football club I'd like to believe they're all given the utmost respect because 
without all those small things at a football club. And I, you were there, Laura, when you know we, I do the same meetings at St. Mary and that the importance of the kit man, the importance of of every single person at the football club matters when you're looking for small percentages. And you know, I I try and give players. I you know I. Don't get me wrong. I'm I'm very hard. I'm very strict in terms of what I demand of them on the training pitch. But we have a laugh as well. You know, I, I can laugh at myself. I don't take myself too seriously. Um, I think the players know that. They hate me on a Saturday. They, you know, Donny always says to me, "You're a great Monday to Friday, but we hate you on a Saturday because I demand so much of them, and I'm so caught up in in wanting them to win and I want them to win and show how good they are. Because you see during the week the the effort they've put in. They're great, great boys who, as I said, you know, don't earn fortunes. They're they all got mortgages, all got kids and families, and just want to see them succeed. So, bar a Saturday, I think all the boys, you know, <laughs> in or out of the team, I have a very good relationship with past and present. I think that's definitely evident, even from our time working together at Motherwell, because it was especially during the COVID years, and it felt really like we were one unit. Whether it was obviously the media team off the pitch or the players in the squads, we, we were kind of the club together. And it just came together and it meant everyone felt as one, didn't it? That's yeah, I so think important. That, that was the success of Motherwell. I, I'm, you know, I think I've created this again at St Mirren where we, the players I recruit are, you know, we, we study them in depth in terms of their personalities. But are they coachable? Is there egos? You know, I don't, I don't do egos. It's a, it's a team, and the individuals will shine within that team. You know, and that's my philosophy, and I've always done that. And you know, I, I remember saying to, um. Aldo, the kit man at Motherwell, you know, what do you do in the morning? And Aldo being Aldo was very bland. I put the kid out. He said, no, no, you're a percentage and a big percentage and us being very, very successful. And I think it's important every member of staff knows that, that their, their bit that they perceive as small is a massive, you know, I said to the cleaning lady, Mo at the, the training ground, you know, you do it really, really well. Brilliant. You know, I'm in at half seven in the gym. Everything's spotless. She's in there at half six in the morning. Everything's spotless. The boys don't see the work that goes into making it look like that. But she's as important as Mark O'Hara, the captain, you know, and, and that sounds ridiculously stupid, but it isn't because all those small bits at a club the size of ourselves need to come together to be to be successful. I think there's definitely watching St Mirren so much of the time, it does feel like a cohesive unit on the park. And, and you mentioned Mark O'Hara there um, by name because he's always a, a player, not not just in terms of the way that he plays, but the way that he carries himself. He just looks like such a leader on the park and the way that in big games as well, you know, his mentality looks like it comes to the fore and he really relishes those occasions and he, you know, brings the rest of the team around him and they rally around and you know, we've had some billboard results in, in recent times of uh, thinking of him. Um, being one of the few teams to beat Ange Postacoglu's Celtic uh, in recent seasons as well. But um, it's uh, across the board, it, it's borne out in the results as well, because you look at last season, that was St Mirren's highest league finish since, I think it was 1985, when Frank McAvenny was was the, the top goal scorer that. of that season. So, I mean, that's incredible, but that's, that's also kind of what you did in, at Motherwell as well. It takes a few seasons, but you build this platform for success. And I'm just wondering where you see that going with St Mirren specifically because you know the, the, it, it seems to to me the, the where they've been in in the last number of seasons or or for last number of decades or whatever is is a team that's probably towards the the bottom end of of the top flight maybe they've gone through more difficult seasons and they've dipped down into the championship and they come back up or whatever but you know, when you hear people like Tony Fitzpatrick, he's always said things like, oh, you know, we want to be top six and we want to be pushing for cups and doing that stuff. Sometimes people have laughed at him or other people at the club with that level of ambition. But is that kind of what you guys are pushing towards? Because it looks like it's starting to get there on the pitch. Well, I mean, when when we first came in, I didn't realise, you know, I, I didn't realise that somewhere and I'd probably spent more time in the championship than I had in the, the Premier League. So it was a bit of a surprise to me. The club has gone through a real transition in the last, you know, 18, what is it, 16, 18 months since I've been here. You know, when I first came in, you know, there was a lot of things that were, you know, looking positive for the league position, but actually we're only four points off 10th. You know, so and I and heard a school that I believe needed more pace and energy into it. The club itself with a training ground, that wasn't functioning properly with an academy and a first team who didn't train together. A lot of this was to do to COVID as well. You know, a lot of, there was a lot of good plans in place about the training ground that weren't finished. The academy trained at night and then the academy stripped her so that we survived. You know, we had a lot of financial problems, 1.6 million debts. So we've actually taken a whole, like Motherwell, you know, 
we, we built the whole football club. We believe we're building a football club and small things, chipping away constantly at small things to make the club better. And, you know, now I think that there's a real togetherness with the academy training at the same time as the first team, young boys coming across and, and you know, interacting, even having the kids there doing their jobs and, and mingling in with the first team. It's um the club's building slowly but surely. I think expectations are are high. Um, they're very difficult to keep meeting because, the, you know, there's we only have a certain amount of fans. Like, like at Motherwell, there was only a certain amount of season tickets. You know, so I think Keith and the board, uh, well, I, I don't think I know they they don't want to go into that kind of debt again. So we have to do it prudently. The the club, you know, every manager wants more players. You know, you want you want better equipment. You know, we've we've put a couple of new ice baths in. They cost one hundred and twenty quid each, by the way. We put new weights in. We've put a new leg weight system in. We've got another analyst that we got an analyst who we didn't have last year. We've done all the analysis ourselves. So for me, that's building the football club. You know, and and gradually making it a sustainable. First of all, an SPL club, and then hopefully knocking into that top six you know we we know how hard it is you've got five clubs that are you know should be probably on paper guaranteed to take those places straight away and we all know who these are where you know and they have a huge fan base and they're able to spend a lot more money because of that huge fan base and rightly so and investors we, we don't have a single investor you know one man or one group that can throw money at it so it all has to be generated so it's a it's a process that um you know i believe is really going in the right direction We've managed to get into the top six, as you you rightly pointed out, for the first time. And it's not about sustaining that. That's the hard bit. And the hard bit I've found is, so the board, you know, the board are constantly trying to help me, but they can't throw millions of pounds at it, you know. So they give me a transfer fee this year, which was probably the first time in probably St. Lawrence history, you know. So we spent 100 grand, and that was with a sponsor putting money into that as well to get Conor McMenamin. Um, But the plan budgets remained the same because... You know, it, if you weigh the playing budget up in, in terms of our crowds and the gener- what we generate off the pitch, then it has to be at that level as much as we want it to be more. So it's about maximising what we've got, you know, and, and building the football club. And I, I know when I leave this football club, for whatever reason, it will be in a much better position than what I inherited. And I'd like to think the same was done at Motherwell. And, you know, people talk about what, what do you want to do? I want to leave St Mirren or continue to work, obviously, with St Mirren, like I left Motherwell in a much better financial position. And, and hopefully healthier on and off the football pitch. Such a big part of that as well, all that success off the pitch is obviously down to Keith Leslie since he took over. How's that dynamic been since he is now your boss, but he, <laughs> he was your assistant at Motherwell? I know, yeah, it's... Um... It, it's been fine, but, you know, I, I, as I say, I treat people with respect all the time anyway. Um, you know, so Keith, Keith's a boss. He's done he's done extremely well. Um, he came in in the middle of a storm. You know, he inherited the, the same as myself, didn't realise there was that many debts. And, you know, we needed to... His idea was he was going to come in, build the academy, all the football side of it. And Keith actually ended up having to get caught up in all the finances and redundancies and, and rebuild the football club, you know, get it to a level it could exist and then start building, you know, obviously the success on the pitch has helped. Player sales, we brought in a, you know, a lot of player sales in the last six, seven months for, you know, not massive fees, but continually bringing in 200 grand, and, you know, 50 grand here and there as well from younger players. So, you know, Keith's now got a real handle on that, um, working closely with the board. And I think he's thriving, he's enjoying it. He's actually probably enjoying the, the non-football side of it a lot more. So I'll take that as a compliment that he trusts me on the football side and he's not too involved in the football side. But no, the dynamic's fine. You know, I've got the utmost respect for Keith. He's, you know, he's, he's done a great job and we don't have a crossword. You know, we've, you know, he puts his opinion on the team. I, I, I use every drop of knowledge that he's got and me, him and Dermot sit there and, and discuss what we do. And the same, you know, he'll ask my advice and some things out with the football side of things. So I think the dynamic's excellent and works really well alongside the, the rest of the board. It definitely seems to be, I, I mean, we're often on, on the podcast praising St Mirren for a lot of the initiatives that they do and for the, the the good work that they do in their community and i think one of the, the the best aspects or one of the the easiest aspects to see the kind of the health of the club and the way that it's growing in this positive way is looking at the attendances and looking at the way that um they were one of the major clubs St Mirren in almost like take, taking hold of of their own fan base and and wanting to cater to them maybe than to other supports um, and that's been borne out in such a positive way where there are um, 
you know, record attendances and season ticket sales and all of that kind of stuff, that surely got to be uh, a positive thing or a reciprocal thing for the players then going out on a Saturday with such a uh, an involved and excited home support. Yeah, it's home and away. I have to be, I have to say, like Saturday traveled in their numbers. It was it was fantastic. You know, we we took a, a really big crowd again to Hibs, and in our last away game, the, the crowd had been fantastic. You know, the, I mean, the the bond between the players and the the fans has been fantastic, and you can see that. You can see all I ever asked. I remember when when I first came in and I didn't didn't start very well. I think I lost seven out of eight when I first came in, and they gave me the microphone on the pitch at the end of the season, and I really really didn't want it. Laura knows I. I don't do too many of these things. I've actually done two in a week, so I don't know what's going on with me. Um, but they gave me the microphone. I said, look, the one thing I'll promise you is I will give you a team that plays for the badge, that plays for the badge and not the name on the back. And, you know, I think they see that. They The boys give everything. The team, as a collective, run their socks off. They, they'll die for the badge and, you know, individuals will shine within that. And if you're a fan and you pay your money, hard-earned money, that, that doesn't come easy to come and watch a game of football, you know that, they're trying their best, and sometimes it doesn't get it doesn't produce the result you want, and sometimes performances and levels of performances aren't what you want. But if someone's given absolutely everything to the cause, and you know that as a fan in the stand, then you know that's all you want as a fan. If you wanted to put that shirt on, you'd run yourself into the ground, and that's what my players do. And I think they can feel that connection. They see that there's a lot of quality there as well. You know, I'm I'm underestimating the amount of quality we have in the squad. But first and foremost, they give everything for the team and the, the badge and, and St Mirren Football Club. So it's um I can understand why the fans want to come and watch. I, I can see the passion between the players and the fans and the staff. And it's it's great to see it at this moment in time, yeah.